Welcome to the Holy Spirit's Curriculum of Joy podcast. My name is Wanaka Overuber, and I'm your host. My guest today is Nathan Curry. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Really nice. Let's start out with a question that I love to ask my guests. How did you come to see the world the way you do today? Yeah, that's a wonderful question, isn't it? That really opens the, the floor to, to a beautiful journey, you know? So I was just thinking, what a brilliant, what a brilliant uh, focus. I mean, you could just have an endless, well, you do, an endless stream of interesting conversations by asking that one question. So I was very impressed by that. Um, well, when I was a child, I was very interested in um, evolutionary biology and the natural world. And um, sorry, my phone made a beep and I'm and my other phone, I'm just switching it off. And uh, I, I sort of, when I was very young, around four years old, I, I wrote a poem about otters and it started, come, come, life has begun. And uh, I had this fascination with the natural world and I've always had it but I I felt like we were there was something about life that we needed to make sense of you know and uh so I was led to evolutionary biology and I, I was sort of on a path to go to Oxford to study with uh, the geneticist and the author of the selfish gene and blind watchmaker and the extended phenotype um Richard Dawkins and I studied with one of his primary students. And, uh, but I also had a father who was an alcoholic and was quite a tortured split mind kind of character. And, um, and, and life at home was very, very, very challenging, extremely cultured family. But I, I had sort of this moment as a teenager where I didn't get to the place I wanted to at Oxford and I, didn't, I wasn't interested in second best. And then a 30 year odyssey began, which has really, you know, taken a long time. I think anyone that comes to mystical teachings, they go through this period of, it's quite difficult to integrate because the world seems so real. And uh, so I, I, I just felt a bit lost and I didn't feel, it was sort of something in my mind that loved science and the scientific method, but felt like it, it didn't have the answer to everything and especially when it comes to death and, and what dies and things like that so um i ended up sort of trying to find a path as a scientist or thinking that, that was the path i should take and i ended up working in in the galapagos and in the, off the coast of uh, colombia on a whale research boat and i remember i met this man who had a phd he was 28 and he turned around to me one day and he said, Nathan, you asked too many questions. And that was a big moment for me because I felt like, well, I <laughs> when, since when is curiosity a problem, you know, um, especially if you're a scientist. And uh, so I began to see how a, a lot of scientists are quite closed minded. Uh, and yet the, the essence of good science is open mindedness, you know, or open to seeing through what you don't know. And, uh, and then I had this moment when I was uh, about 19 and I met Tara Singh, who was this incredible being. I'd never met, I'd met poet laureates. I'd met world-class scientists. I'd met um, they'd, poet laureates and stayed at her house. I'd met all these incredible people, but uh, some of the greatest mathematicians um, of the last century, uh, just a whole interesting stream of people had come into my life by that age but then I met Tara Singh and he'd spent five years in meditation studying um, met yoga and then in Carmel after studying with Krishnamurti for 30 years and uh, he I met him I just massaged Jennifer Aniston one of her close friends uh, in the Hollywood Hills and I came down with my friend to the Miracle Mile in Los Angeles and I gave a, a this massage and I was this beautiful there was this beautiful woman that I'd massaged I was like 18 and I just massaged in this gorgeous Hollywood actress and there were these beautiful 
kites flying over Laurel Canyon in Hollywood. And we went down, there was this little Indian man sitting on a chair and he read a line from the Course in Miracles and said, you know, uh, I am determined, after about five minutes silence, he said, I am determined to see differently. And then he said to what was probably a room of about 30 people of which he probably knew 10, um, not one of you in this room know the state that behind the word determination. And uh, I remember I read a poem as a, as a very uh, younger person I, and it was about a little girl that brushed slightly just pre prepubescent boy and girl. And the boy, the girl brushes past the boy and uh, it, there's a line in the poem that says that, you know, the, the hem of her skirt touching his thigh was like the biggest punch he ever got in his face in his life. Um, and I, I, that moment when this man said, not one of you in this room know the state behind determination, uh, that was sort of like my spiritual version of the line in that poem. And it was just like, holy shit, who is this guy? And he just spoke with so much certainty. And uh, I then sort of was lost in the wilderness for a while, but I studied the Course in Miracles with him. I became a massage therapist. I went to Paris. I um, wrote songs for a, a French, a, a German rock star. I worked at a bookshop in Paris, famous bookshop called Shakespeare and Company. I, uh, I then met this American woman and we went back and I, I just, all I could think of was to be close to Tara Singh. That was the only thing that had any meaning to me. And so, you know, I, I did massage in California. My first wife back then, she was um, sort of on a trajectory of a very academic path. And then I spent several years studying with him, uh, Tara Singh, and studying The Course in Miracles and had a number of visions. I kept having dreams and visions of Krishnamurti and then I had visions which guided me to study with Tara Singh and Krishnamurti's yoga teacher for a decade in India. So like I went from this and I, I had a relapse in, you know, uh, Robert A. Johnson, the psychotherapist who is uh, a wonderful Jungian psychotherapist, one of the greatest, I, in my opinion, he wrote these three wonderful books, He, She and We. But I, he talks about when you're 18 and sort of between 45 and 55, you go through these moments where you have these deep introspections. And it's like, um, you know, there's a certain stage when a baby's born, you can kind of open the skull, like it's still pliable. And it's like when you're in these two stages of life, like the brain is very, it's, it's, it's like at the beginning of like early life or as an adult, and then it's the beginning of midlife. And so they're very, they have a, a lot in common. And so I had this sort of relapse in the last couple of years to this scientific materialism because I love science. And I thought uh, that you could, that, that heaven here was, was here on earth. There was nothing beyond it. And all of my like studies in metaphysics kind of dropped away for a moment. I was sort of revolting against it. And then I realized that, you know, even I had some great insights into hydrogen fusion and the future of uh, fuel economy. And, but even if we have this unlimited fuel, we still have avariciousness. We still have death. We still have insecurity. We still have greed. And so my whole like born again scientist phase was uh, repeated both at 18 and sort of 48. And then that dropped away. And now I just, I am in a very a quiet place inside and I'm, I'm building two brands inspired by my study of Advaita Vedanta, Ramana Maharshi, The Course in Miracles and Yoga Sutras. And the brands are supposedly, you know, like, cause there's Hay House and the Sounds True and they're all fine but i i just want i think that the only thing that we should really be focusing on is sanity is to matter is um, i'm not talking about like technology and science and having a job in the world but as individuals you, know, you get to a certain right point where the only thing that really matters is peace and enlightenment so like there's been loads of you know and i've made a video yesterday about the difference between awe and fear the course in miracles talks about that and so i had this deep download of knowledge about quantum physics last year or a year and a half ago 
and it, it was just knowledge with a small k and it was like it didn't bring me peace it brought, brought me excitement and passion to help humanity and then i thought then i saw through all of that and it was just fear really it was just more information um so that, that that's been a, a sort of quick overview and you know the sutra novum is about i said i said to myself well can you build a brand that that takes the teachings that i'm fond of and puts it in a language that has no religious weight to it and uh and yet you know and so, so that's what the focus of sutra novum is and bodhi sutra is playing on darwin's monkey and he's he's like a character that comes from a parallel universe and he's asleep and you know got all these issues that asleep in the spiritual sense but he's grasping you know and he's like he's the character that is our is the mirror to all our failings in 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 in, in deeper peace and it, it's a mirror to how you recognize recognize that failing and and can laugh it gently away without too much guilt and un unkindness to yourself or others so that's um that's a little bit about me if that helps i don't know i could talk for much longer but i want to respect your it's your show so i'll go on silent thank you so much for sharing all this i think it's very important to look at the the idea of science and of course the miracles and spirituality and why as we know, A Course in Miracles came from two psychologists, so they were scientists in their own rights. So it has a lot of thinking that is scientific. And one of the things that A Course in Miracles shares about is the quality of open-mindedness that you were speaking about. Now, the, the question is, how do we stay open-minded, right? Because rejecting science, rejecting spirituality, rejecting this. We're always rejecting something, but we're also always accepting and welcoming something into our lives. Now, open-mindedness is more, goes deeper than that play. So maybe you would like to share about your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I know one of your rules is not to talk about um badly of people but um i think i can talk generically because um so i i was i had I'd, I'd reached this kind of journey where i thought my destiny was to go and look at you know i'd created this comedy and i'd created this other sister brand which has got this aspiration to be a publishing company and sort of inspired by the course of miracles and it's called sutra novum which means the new thread of meaning, right? And so if you look at some of the beautiful passages in The Course in Miracles, it says things like, well, this is an ancient truth wrapped in new language, right? And so, um, but I, I, I paused all of this and I thought, well, I need to get a proper job and, you know, I don't like English teaching and so forth. That's not really where my passion is. I've done so many things in my life. Um, so I went to do a degree at a university in Britain and it was a BA in psychotherapy, you know, and I've always love the psychotherapy pamphlet in the course of miracles but talking about open-mindedness you know like i think there's only a few degrees in all the degrees that you can study at the universities of the world that are both a ba and a bsc and psychotherapy is one of them and the interesting thing about the word art it means originally it means uh, skill or the, the, the capacity to put things in their right place and science means to know that's the root meaning of science and so science and art there's an art to science and there's a science to art you know like you look at you know textiles and stuff there's a whole technology that goes into that and then you look at like the art of a beautiful equation um e equals mc squared or something like that and there's, there's simplicity and elegance to it but but yes, I think there's a, maybe two other degrees, I can't think of them off the top of my head, that have this BA, BSc bias. And so I did the BA, but I was just blown away because I'd studied the Course in Miracles for so long. And I think actually that the scientific world and the social sciences and the academic world is often very close-minded, which is why I find the, just as the religious world can be very close-minded because it's my belief system versus yours. And it's like, it's like this cult of thought, whether it's religious thought or it's the cult of scientific thought. And uh, 
I, I went on this degree and it was just like this kind of very, very closed minded approach to the mind. And it was one of the things that I've lived in 32 countries, but the predominant countries I've lived in are the United States, England and India. And um, the longest periods of my life, you know, I've spent a third of my life in the Americas. I've spent a third of my life in Europe and I've spent a, a third of my life in, in Asia. And uh, what I would say about British culture, and I'm not so, I, I don't think this is quite as true for European culture. It is to an extent, is that Britain is probably the most atheistic country on the planet. It's um, uh, maybe with the exception of China. And so when you go into an academic setting like that, you have, you know, words like truth are dirty words, you know? And so it was really interesting to see how the religious world, you know, if you go to a Krishnamurti school and you talk about, which I've done, and you mention anything from The Course in Miracles, you know, Holy Spirit uh, in, in Krishnamurti's language is intelligence. And if you go to, um, you know, I've been to Christian monasteries and they think The Course in Miracles is blasphemy. And uh, if you go to India and you talk about um, among the Ramana devotees and Advaita Vedanta, and you talk about Christ or um, Holy Spirit, uh, they think you're, you know, some kind of Christian loony. And if you go to um, the Course in Miracle groups on Facebook, often you know, if you mention Ramana, you see closed mindedness everywhere you go. But again, the Course in Miracles is saying, we see what we are, you know? So this closed mindedness, I think on that degree course, you know, I felt like the greatest psychotherapist of the modern world, without a doubt in my mind. And I mean that not in the sense of a spiritual teacher, but it's a, a technical psychotherapist. It would be um, Helen Shukman. You know, she, she made this incredible contribution and she said of the Course in Miracles, and this was her closed mindedness talking, um, I don't believe it, but I know it's true. So her belief system was like, you know, she describes herself as an atheist and so forth. But the thing I, I think that where maturity comes in here has got nothing to do with what you believe, right? You know, you could be an agnostic and be completely enlightened. You could be an atheist and be completely enlightened. And that's what I, you know, Tara Singh used to say, you know, the rubber really hits the road when you, you get to the place where the facts are what's are being talked about, right? And so the fact is, are you a body? Uh, uh, is psychological time real, you know? Um, and so these are things that I think often people that have been trained in a certain discipline are actually very unaware of how conditioned and, and blocked they are. And as I just, I just referenced, you know, various different specific groups, whether it's Christians or Course in Miracles students or um, um, scientific people or atheistic people, their minds can be very closed and very, uh, yeah, very blocked. Whereas, you know, I, I describe myself as a natural scientist and, and that word goes back to this beautiful word logos, which comes from uh, the father of modern science, who was Parmenides. And Logos, the Christian meaning of Logos is the word, but Logos means to see uh, the parts in the context of the whole. So that's, it's very much connected with the sense of intelligence to read between the lines of thought or the Holy Spirit, which is the same sensibility, you know? And so Logos is meaning, are you, are you, and so when you look at like, there's an ecologist in Africa that you know, fascinates me, he's way ahead of his time. And he says, you know, everything works together. And when we take the top predators out of the, um, the ecosystem, then we have uh, absolute chaos. You know, you hear the story of um, Mao in China and he had this theory because he was like in so much power that if he took out all the sparrows, the famine would go away. And it got worse because, you know, the sparrows had an integral place to play in in the whole ecosystem. So, yeah, there's there's lots of insanity, whether it's in politics and in science, in 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 um, in in um, 
in religion. But in my experience, like Logos, is it, it works across the board. You know, it's Logos is a mystical study of the nature of things. And um, it's, 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 uh, it covers everything, you know, it covers any realm, like holistic thinking, uh, wisdom, love is, can go anywhere. It's, it's, it's formless. And so it can adapt to anything. Whereas I think, you know, often you find, uh, I think that's one of my great strengths in life. And also my greatest failing is that I haven't become an expert. Um, I've become an expert in my interests. But one of the challenges is if you're an anthropologist or you're a doctor, you become an, you know, a specialist in Amazonian Indians or you become a specialist in uh, eye, nose and throat. And um, it's like, you, you know, it's like this uh, Yogananda talks about how, you know, there's a line in the Yoga Sutras and it, it can be misinterpreted to focus on the, the point at the, you know, at the end of the nose. And if you do that, you go cross-eyed. And I think, I think that that's often what's, you know, this myopic view of the mind um, and the meaning of our existence takes over. And so we take the story of Jesus literally, literally or we, and, and we, we start to worship him when he's saying, don't worship me, you know, find out who you are. So I think open-mindedness is, is one of the most crucial elements to intelligence and uh, emotional intelligence and affection, you know, to, to, because the moment you bring in your theories, you know, if they, they, if they lack that logos, then you become a zealot for, for a form of violence, really, this separation between individuals. Yeah, there's a lot to say about this, about how how open-mindedness is crucial. And there's a lot to say about how in the world we are very separation-oriented. So we need this, we need that, we want this, we want that. And of course, the miracles, it's all about we are whole, we are holy, we are innocent, we already have everything, and we are walking each other home when it comes to interacting with each other in the world and remembering who we actually are and we already are one so yeah the, the science and, and the spirituality and all these other directions that can go into the the closed-mindedness is also possible with the course of miracles if you if you choose to see it that way but it, of course, in my opinion and my understanding of A Course in Miracles, open-mindedness is not something that means I have to stay stuck with a certain language, a certain way of expressing things, a certain community, and so on and so forth. So I, I see it as a, an opening up to, to the opportunity of seeing oneself as whole and seeing each other as whole. Yeah, I mean, back to that university degree. So, um, I, I, w one of the things that because of my travels, you know, like there's a one percent divorce rate in India, and uh, in Britain it's forty two percent, in New York it's fifty two percent, and in in California it's fifty one percent, and uh, it's quite high in China, um, nowhere near as high as the West, but, you know. Krishnamurti was asked once, you know, what makes a religious man? And he said two things. He said, a religious man is um, half female and half male, not in the sexual sense, not in the homosexual or transsexual or anything like that sense. And that's got nothing to do with it. If you want to be homosexual, that's fine. That's your choice. No judgment there. But it, um, uh, that's really critical. And uh, the other thing that makes a religious man is having no center, which means the death of the ego, right? So it's not about my view or what I want, although there is a certain level of preference being in a body, but it's about listening, you know, and, and, and that center is gone. But I, going on that degree course, it was just a shock to me, having studied the course of miracles for so long to see how these academic ivory towers were just lost in this kind of really how do I put it, like, sort of, like, 
intellectually boring and 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 um and toxic kind of ego baiting i'm right you're wrong not let's find out what's actually true kind of vibration and i mentioned that you know um referencing the divorce rates because you were talking about being whole right and i, I was like I, I think this whole movement with the pronouns is very dangerous because the yin and yang is something very ancient about that and of course at the level of spirit we're not men or women but then this whole politicization of the pronouns and i just saw how it come into the culture and it was it was just like it was like dominating the conversation when you know a psychotherapy degree would be well where does sanity lie and how do you push further into healthness healthfulness you know healthiness and um but it was really about these very closed-minded views about you know uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a brown homosexual or I'm a white feminist and it was like uh, no different from the sort of trials of the um, you know the Salem witch trials it, but it was shifting this whole momentum and if you go back to the 1930s it was the communist versus the fascist now it's the woke versus the anti woke and it was just like there was no intelligence in the room in terms of the authorities in the room because they were so wrapped up in this separated activism and you can condemn that but then you become trapped in the ego story but like it's amazing how insecure and clever and mercurial the ego is that it wants to create this agenda of like a thousand different sects in the catholic you know the christian church and then all these billions of you know stories with the hindus and then uh, gods and then the same thing in like this this approach to therapy and then this and there's all this judgment that goes with it and there's a lot of close-mindedness to it and so it was funny because I think that situation for me was because I, I spent so much time studying metaphysics of the Course in Miracles and so much time studying the Indian uh, system of thought that going into this very kind of activist-centered, petty playing field, you know, definitely on the battleground, not above the battleground, the atmosphere of what was being taught, it was just it was mind blowing to me how, you know, and I see this with like, in fact, in the animation that we're creating, I, I wanted to, cause art is often a wonderful way to hold the mirror up to society. And I think the animation that is developing Bodhi Sutra, it's a, it's a real hit to zeitgeist cause there's this Darwin's monkey in there. And, um, you know, it's like the born again scientists have come along since Darwin and Einstein. And yet, you know, if you look at Joseph Campbell, science is just one of the four functions of four functions of myth. It covers the cosmological function, which is the measuring of the physical universe. But it can't it can't handle morality. It can't handle death. Uh, it can't handle the stages of life. It's it's only about measuring stuff. That's all that science is about. And out of measuring things, distances between protons and atoms, you discover their nature, and then you can develop technology to to create, you know, all these different magical, marvelous things that we we define our world by today, whether it's the iPhone or you know a toaster. But but uh, you know this this cosmos. So in in the cartoon, there's a character that is a, he's called a born born again character, and sometimes he's schizophrenic, and sometimes he's a born again Christian, and sometimes he's a born again Hindu, and sometimes he's a born again scientist, and sometimes he's a born again atheist, and it's to sort of like, because in the Course in Miracles, it says, you know, remembering to laugh is so important. Or he's a born again, you know, activist. And we have to be very careful with that because obviously issues around transgender and and uh, homosexuality and and male and female rights are quite quite uh, combustible and, and 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 can lead to a lot of tension. But we don't want to focus on the tension. We want to see the tension from a place of humor. And because uh, that's not what defines us. That's what, but I think you can, it's very helpful to laugh a lot of that stuff off because, as Oscar Wilde said, you know, life is far too important to take seriously. And that's, you know, one of the great, you know, well, there's a line in The Course in Miracles that's always resonated with me. And it says, a religion is remembering to laugh. And that's not what we think of traditionally. When we think of religion, we think of like, you know, uh, Martin Luther and the sort of stoic stamping to a do door in, in Germany back in the day. And we think of, you know, um, Moses and it's like all these, you know, great stories. But that's the beauty. And as Tara Singh used to say about The Course in Miracles, he said, 
this is the first religious text that speaks to man right all the other religious texts are about you as a man as a woman as a child whereas all the other religious texts are about great characters in history right moses or buddha and so forth um, or muhammad and so that's what's so revolutionary and that it came through this marriage between the nexus of a, a discipline that's both artistic uh, psychotherapy and scientific you can get a ba or a bsc or an ma or msc but I, when i went into that world i just found that you know the the way it was taught was completely uh dissociated from the deep wisdom of the course in miracles it was very much born of the separated mind and i, I just i think that's you know it, that's the majority of the world as it is you know the world is asleep it thinks that it's real it thinks this body in this world exists and it thinks that anger is justified and it thinks that that um what is that great great wisdom in the course you know the world is um you are not uh, um the world is not your cause the world is the effect of your mind right and so that's such a just to get that like it took me 30 years really to get that statement you know in my bones and uh i think for most people to really get that statement because i you know i started off studying evolutionary biology and thinking we came from genes and then you go to india and so in genetic terms uh like they have something called samskaras and vasanas right so uh, richard dawkins wrote his book the blind watchmaker and it's this book about how like evolution just kind of fuddles through it's like a blind watchmaker and somehow the mystery of it all comes a watch or, or or a pea flower or a dog or a monkey uh, but then from the course in, sorry, from the, the Hindu mystical perspective, thought and habit, vasanas and samskaras, the little girl that puts her finger in the flame, uh, ow, that's the first time she's had the experience of a flame. So the, 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 the flame touching her finger is a vasana that, that creates the habit. And then uh, the habit is called a samskara. And so the samskara is code for the genetics. And so everything is a creation of the mind. Whereas the, the this, so I kind of, I, every, everything I've gone into and failed at was because I went deeper than the discipline itself. And I'm so grateful I did, but it's been difficult because when you, you know, the, the Course in Rebels talks about the authority problem. And when you, uh, you know, it's like, I think we all have this archetype within us of, you know, the 12 year old Jesus in the temple. And he goes, you know, and in my case, the 12 year old Jesus in the temple archetype went to the Oxford University and, you know, saw flaws in the arguments for this whole genetic obsession. And then it went to the psychotherapy degree on the back of studying with someone that studied with Helen Schuchman. And it saw the flaws of all these idols, you know, and the course talks about this is the authority problem. And so I think you're constantly going to have this character in your own mind who's slaying these false authorities. And of course, the system doesn't like that because it, it wants to, you know, this is how you do it, son, and so forth. And that's what's the great beauty of the Course in Miracles, because you can't build a church around it. And the same thing with Ramana, you know you can't start to install all these bishops and hierarchies and uh you know it it's it, it's it's it as as my teacher said you know it all is about the individual coming to grace you know and that grace is like question who am i what is talking in my thoughts in my mind how do i see what is talking in another do i see it as an attack or do i see it as a cry for love and so you know it, it, this this is why it's incredibly simple, but for most people, in my experience, like they're stuck in that the temple of the twelve-year-old Jesus, and that inner questioner that questions all these characters that have, you know, authority over what's true in their mind. Those those authorities tend to rule, and so, you know, we and it's interesting because organizations tend to. You, it's like I was reading this, uh, listening to a video by Robert A. Johnson the other day, and he said, you go to a psychotherapist and you pay the money and you think, okay, now you can heal me. And he said he got far greater success when people weren't paying money for his, you know, and he said, this is what the priesthood learned early on when they were working, when it worked, was that when the priests were liberated of this, you know, everything was done by trade and barter. There was a grace to it. But the moment you brought money into it, I paid for my, movie ticket play me the movie i'll be passive i paid for my psychotherapy 
interaction. Now you heal me. But that's not what psychotherapy is about. It's about, and it's a really funny story that Robert A. Johnson told us because this really young, lovely young man came and he said, you know, I don't have enough money. So, well, look, I'll give you free psychotherapy if you do the homework. And uh, I think a few weeks in, he's doing the homework. And then the guy said, oh, can't I just pay for this? You know, <laughs> because when you're looking at uh, the blocks in your mind to the truth, you know, it's a, if anyone thinks that the journey, I think you get to a certain plateau, but for a long time, I think, I think handling this world and the insanity of it that you see projected out there um, is a very, very difficult process. And, you know, it's, it's not all, you know, spirituality, I would say is mostly hell, right? And if anyone's trying to sell you this, you know, and that's what the law of attraction is all about, that kind of like, you know, make your perfect place on earth. And it's just like decorating a prison because your job is to transcend the illusions you're a body. And that's, you know, that's not, I don't think that's a very, I think that's why the Course in Miracles is speaking to some very refined minds and often people that are not ready for that full refinement but they have a taste of it and they sort of think okay so god didn't create the universe the universe is created by the ego and my job is to undo the illusions that it's real and that's a big step for most people and you know our faith in science and what's very much a very closed mind ver minded version of science and therapy often blocks us to true the true expansive story of grace that's waiting inside us. Very important to, to accept the, the aspect that you were speaking about grace and, and allowing oneself to see differently, like you were saying at the beginning with Tara Singh saying, I, I, I want to see differently, right? As it comes from the Course in Miracles. And yeah, to choose to see differently is something when you're in the midst of turmoil is quite challenging. And we also, there's also this belief, you know, in a savior, someone who will save you from outside or from within. And this idea that that might be something separate from who you are. And so the resources don't come freely without opening up to a different view of that. So I don't know what your experience is with that, but I, I think there's a, there's a huge amount of tr a transformation power in discovering these things and finding another way. Yeah, you know, like I want to talk about a very personal experience because I think I think I think the Course in Miracles is a very personal journey. So, you know, I understand that people will listen to our conversation today and it will be supportive of shifts that happen in their lives, just as I've listened to conversations that have supported mine. But um from a very young age I've had this great love of birds and uh so in ancient Greek, the word for, for bird is the same word as the word is omen. And, um, you know, you look at a lot of great stories. A bird comes in from the forest and the adventure begins, you know. And um, so I've watched birds with a passion until I was 18. I, I was a very passionate bird watcher. And I'm now in Ecuador and there's a beautiful vermilion flycatcher across the way in a, in a, a mango grove mango tree grove as I'm sitting here talking to you but the most extraordinary bird that I've ever seen in my life this is such an interesting story I I'd just gone through my second divorce with an American woman and uh, this was a couple of years ago and I was in this beautiful garden something led to me this to, to this garden which I was taking care of and I was producing my uh, publishing company and my animation I was working back at it back then and I had a moment where I sat down in the garden I think I was drinking a cup of coffee in the afternoon and a bird called a uh, dark-eyed junco arrived and the Latin word for this 
bird is Junko Hymelis, right? And Junko means reed or sedge or grass. And Hymelis means that which flowers in the winter. And I've watched a lot of birds in my life. I've watched, you know, vultures in Crete, uh, eagles in France, um, loons in America. You know, I just have a great love of the natural world. But this bird was the most extraordinary experience I've ever had with a bird in my life. And I, it, it relates to your question or, or inference about grace. But it's a very, uh, it was one of the most pivotal experiences and one of the most difficult experiences of my life. So the bird came into the garden and it was a rare subspecies uh, of the dark-eyed junco that has a red uh, eye, a red ring around its eye, not so many of them. And these birds are native to North America and they, this particular species lives in Oregon and California. So this little bird came and I had this sense that when it arrived that it was something quite special. And uh, it's, it, it dropped down onto the floor. And at the time I was studying Nikola Tesla and some of the floors in Einstein's work in special relativity and uh, this fascinating field of gravitational field forces and things to do with um, entropy and fundamental physics. So I was studying it in my spare time. It just came as a set of curious synchronicities. And uh, I was very interested in how protons fuse in, uh, hydrogen protons fuse in the sun. Like, and so if you think about God and you think about um, creation, you know, the scientific um, version of God and creation is the hydrogen atom because it's the number one element. So I was just this sort of spiritual, not spiritual, scientific materialism was going on. Anyway, uh, what happened was this bird came in and it dropped down on the ground and then it there's a certain breed of um african tribe that has this dance where they dance from the knees down and they have these big competitions you can see them on on the internet dancing and this bird for about five minutes it started to move its feet in, in an action that i've never seen a bird do you know and it was very much this sense of a daemon or an omen before the christians came and corrupted the word da demon daemon meant something that came from the spirit of nature to enlighten you about life and it's such a beautiful word daemon um, and uh, there's been a, 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 I think his name is Philip K. Dick, but one a modern author that's written about this, this beautiful Greek idea. And if you look at the, uh, I think he was a French chemist or German chemist, Kakule, uh, he won, I think he won a Nobel Prize for it. Um, but he was trying to figure out benzene and the snake Ouroboros came into a dream in his mind. And Ouroboros was the mystical snake that ate its own tail from Greek mythology. And so that was a daemon. But this was a daemon that came into my life that day. And uh, it, it, it did this thing for about five minutes, going faster and faster and faster. You know, no, no possible reason for it to do it from a biological point of view. And then it shot up to the sky like a rocket. And uh, I realized that it was describing what happens when how the energy builds up in the quantum field of, of, of getting to the point where the strong force between uh, hydrogen protons is broken. And I, I suddenly thought, wow, you know, like there's this grace here and I've been had this experience and this leads to and it led to some research in an advanced field of mathematics called uh, topology. But uh, but I want to say something about this because it felt like grace at the time, right? But it was grace in the most awful way because it was me confronting my, my, my scientific materialism. And of course, you know, it led to me having some ideas about um, gyroscopic forces that are influenced and needed to create uh, artificial gravity uh, so that we could replicate hydrogen fusion on earth and then if you have this hydrogen fusion you have unlimited energy and um, like the whole economy of man will change so I suddenly was like this the sense you know this is heaven we're here this is heaven right and this bird was this emissary of this like the the Indians separate Prakriti and Purusha, right? So Prakriti is the world of nature and Purusha is the world of spirit. And so all of science is in the realm of Prakriti, all of art and physics is the realm of um, 
of of prakriti but what's interesting is that i think the mind is lost in the grace of that the great scientists all the grace that they experience is in the realm of prakriti but i wanted to be free of suffering that was my deeper need and my deeper interest so i had this experience where i was given some sense some taste of original thought in terms of nature and then i didn't have the mathematical capacity to back it up right but i had this zealot mind and it's really interesting because the closest character that i found to my experience was carl jung had all these prophecies at the end of his life about the future and uh, I think he got lost a little bit in being a guru. And so it was really helpful for me, for me to have this experience. It was probably the most painful experience of my life in a sense, because I thought I'd, I'd stumbled into something really original scientifically, and I had, but then I couldn't back it up with a proof or research. Uh, or I did try and research it in universities in Britain, and I spoke to mathematicians and I made progress with it. But then I, it hit, I hit a wall to me was that the grace of that experience was that I was seeing the limits of Prakriti. And so, you know, you've got one life on this planet. And at what point are you going to let go of the illusions in medicine, in, um, in, you know, like I have a special diet to help the skin ish issue I have, like, I'm pretty attached to it because it works, right? So that, that that's what the course calls magic. But then these deeper layers of our conditioning, you know, when you've been raised by with a passion for the great scientists and things, and then you're given an experience at that level, you know, like Einstein with the, sorry, Newton with the apple and stuff, and you have some kind of daemon coming from nature to reveal something. I know that might be an apocryphal story with Newton, but, but this thing happened in the bird. But then another way of interpreting the bird's presence is this, you know, this movement that happens, uh, the closest thing in the physical universe to infinity is when, uh, you know, two protons fuse and you get a nuclear fusion or they break apart. Huge amounts of energy are released, almost infinite really forms of energy. But really what I think it was saying in hindsight, apart from those interesting forays into the physical world, and the nature of the physical world and mother, mother nature revealing her secret. It was also saying, Nathan, please drop the illusion that you're here to fix mankind's problems. You're here to solve the illusion um, or undo the illusion that, that the world exists, you know? And so grace can often be horrific because it, you know, it speaks to you at the level that you're ready to hear. And in that case, you know, this bird came and it was an omen. And I, I went on this sort of wild goose chase of getting some insights into nature, only to recognize where it's all meaningless, you know, like, it's not going to help me master peace. It's not going to help me, you know, okay, breakthroughs at that level in science and technology lead to major, you know, things like the, the contraceptive pill or electricity or the nuclear bomb or the special theory of relativity and the regenerative theories, those things are really powerful to change things in the outside world, but they never solve uh, the deeper problem of suffering and why we're born, you know? And so, and, and I don't think that the church or the psychotherapy uh, world does a very good job of this in general. Some rare individuals do. And, um, you know, I think, uh, somehow we have to cultivate our lives with maturity to sort of recognize that the most important thing is to die before we die you know and i think i think the the sorry some some monks do well at this um but at my experience in monasteries is it tends to put you in this very closed-minded process and i i'm not very good at, i'm too much of a free spirit so yeah i think i think I, a part of me has yearned for a long time that there was a, such a thing as um, a course in miracles monastery. And if, you know, David Hoffmeister, he has one in Mexico and Utah, I think it is. But uh, I, I've come to the conclusion that the course in miracles is something you practice and, and often communities can be escapes. And I met a priest not too long ago, a Christian priest in America online. And he was talking to me about, Shenandoah, I think her name is, and she was when Lewis and Clark, the the white man that went from the middle of America to the West Coast, when they got to the middle, they didn't know the way, right? And they knew that, that this vast country probably had an end, and they were on this exploratory journey, and they took it, 
and um, and this this woman Shenandoah, I think her she, she, oh, I can't remember her name. I think I'm getting it wrong. Um, anyway, this lady she turns up. She's on the tip of my tongue, and she didn't know the way, but she knew the terrain. And uh, I think if you're in a marriage, if you're studying the Course in Miracles, if you're studying any you know advanced mystical tradition, whether it's Krishnamurti. Uh, or Ramana, you're, it helps to have characters along the way that you can have dialogues with and um, help look at what's talking in you, like that experience with the bird, right? From a point of view of my inner scientist, it was a moment of great grace. From the point of view of my, um, of my wiser self, it was, a, it was a moment of great calamity because I was stuck in trying to prove that the course in miracles was wrong to a degree it was like well why you know why isn't this enough this world enough you know why isn't it this, this nature and this must be a way that man can get over his horrific nature and live in harmony on this planet and then that all fell away and i realized well that's you know that's not what this ego universe is it's a it's a world of duality and contrast and it, like it brought me a lot of peace but i i recognized and I referenced that woman that took these men across, you know, the, the Western part of the United States. You need a character like that, that nurtures and guides and has a sense of the terrain, whether it's in your marriage or in your spiritual life, um, whether it's something that you cultivate as an intuition or actual people that show up in your life that are extensions of that intuition. But uh, yeah, grace can be horrific sometimes if you're like it, to, because there's a battle inside you that wants to be right. Right. And then, the more you bury down into I know nothing, you know, you know, and it was like the arrogance of my scientific mind wanting to be making this breakthrough. And it definitely touched on something there. But then the the beauty of my capacity to be wrong and to listen won through. And so that bird was a real it was a it was a a great uh challenge for me because it it wasn't coming from an experience of nature in its normal format it was coming from it had a spiritual element to it you know and so it's it's amazing how grace comes and grace can be horrific sometimes you know i remember my mentor tara singh he became enamored with kali and he wouldn't read in the books about it and of course all the gods are manifestations of consciousness so he sat down in meditation and Kali came to him in the real form and he said mother why why are you so horrific right and Kali said uh, because I love my children so much that I I want to warn them of ill thought out action so the consequences that I represent by my, you know, belt of cut off arms and my necklace of human shrunken skulls um, warns them to have reverence for life and not to think rashly and act rashly. So grace can be horrific and grace can be beautiful. You know, it's a, yeah, that's a story I thought that fitted well with uh, your, 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 your introduction there about what grace is. Yeah, it's important to look into these things and to go deeper, like you said. And it all goes way beyond the rational thought or the idea that. And like, yeah, where do, where do you go from? I'm not. Um, I'm wrong, right? Or, um, but it's not someone else is right. It's just. I'm wrong about this because I'm not feeling well. That is what A Course in Miracles says. You know, I'm wrong about it because um, it's not helpful. It's not good for me or it's not good for anyone. Right? I'm not wrong because I did something inherently wrong or because it's bad or whatever, but because of what it does. It leads me astray from what my life is meant to be or who I am. 
Yeah, and actually the name of the lady just came back to me. Her name was Sachigaweka. And it was really interesting because I went into these monasteries and this this story of my friend, the priest, it really stuck with me because, you know, if you're a monk in a monastery, and I think we're all monks, whether you're a woman or a man as a nun, you're all a monk because, you know, you're walking back home uh, in the solitude of your solace uh, with with your own divinity. And, um, but, you know, if you're going into the monastery, you're going to come, you know, going into the monastery in the cell of your contemplation, you know, you're going to come across this hall of mirrors. And um, in my experience, you know, like I had to like, it's like a totem pole, you know, you're, and there's all these idols. And this is when you're on the, uh, uh, when you're out on the road, you'll come along and you'll meet the Buddha and you've got to kill the Buddha, right? Because the Buddha you meet is a, ref, is, 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 is an idol. Right. And so that's someone inside you that you have to. So you have to kill that character, this reverence for your teacher, your reverence for Jesus or your reverence for the Course in Miracles. And so uh, there are all these thresholds on the journey of um, inner transformation. And you see them in the life of a marriage or you see them in the life of your, your journey with a very deep spiritual teaching. And. um this character, Satya Gawaka, represents this feminine intuition that comes along and sort of says, the older monk to the younger monk, ah, you're going through that. I've been through that. I don't know exactly what your version of, of, is, of it is like. I don't know the way to California, but I have the sense of the terrain, you know? And so this feminine intuition, and I think, you know, older men speaking to younger men about their marriage or older women speaking to younger women about their marriage you know you you, you need these mentor style characters to handle all you know the, the major challenges of a life and you know i've just been through another divorce and i went to the psychotherapy degree and i thought the people teaching it were insane right and of course from the course of miracles perspective that's a, just a projection of my own insanity but what you have to do is you have to find your path in life and the world is a pretty crazy place, you know? And so it's, it's a school to look in the mirror. And so how do you find your place? And um, recently I've come back to this idea that, you know, my real inspiration, because, you know, The Course in Miracles in chronological time, which of course is an illusion, is, is only 50 or 60 years old. And I remember when I was studying it with my teacher, you know, he knew Mother Teresa. And he had a meeting with her. And I think in the early days of the course, because it's in this very Christian language and so forth, you know, like, what's a saint? Well, you know, someone like Mother Teresa. But I don't think that's what a saint is at all. I think a saint is just someone that's ended the illusion of, you know, I'm a body. And, you know, they're living a fairly normal life and they're decent people. But, you know, that experience at university, I, I had to go to the police and I was, you know, threatened with physical violence because I didn't kowtow to their um, very petty agenda, right? And, 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 and then, you know, I was very hurt and traumatized by the experience. I had to leave the country and um, it caused a great rift with my family. But from a distance, I saw it as like it was a very different one of the hardest lessons to learn from the course in miracles is that you know all the negative things that's going on in the world the genocide the rapes the you know sexism towards men sexism towards women uh hatred of transgenders transgenders hatred of you know all of this stuff it's all coming from a place of fear and none of it has any substantiality to it at all so you know i got charged this big lump of money and accused and was shamed and so forth and there's a there's a there's a quote by mel gibson that says you know our greatest fear like in the yoga sutras it says all fear is at the, at the heart of all fear is the death and it's primarily the death of the self right so the small self but mel gibson says the greatest fear that we have is of being shamed, right? If I, if I go and say nasty things about you and Wanaku in public and muddy your reputation, you know, it's no one likes that. It's not pleasant at all. But then I had to look at that and say, okay, that's to be forgiven too. Because if I believe in any of that insanity, I believe it's in me because it's a projection, you know? And so that was one of the most difficult experiences of my life to sort of, 
because the course of miracles i think you know you start off with uh i don't you know nothing i see in this room means anything i've given everything that i see means to me i'm not a victim of the world i see i'm not a body i'm spirit joy is my nature and then you know these statements are you know for some people that will take thousands of years to really filter in and those people that are really serious it it, it, it comes in I think it, I think you know some people just get it right away, and I think that I, I haven't met anyone like that. I've met someone that was born in that state, but I think for the majority of people, it's a slow, steady process of just you know like because it's it's this movement from what sounds like abstraction because this table that I'm sitting at and this this sweater that I'm wearing all is very real, right? To this to this. It's a movement towards the abstraction to see the things that we think are real as abstract, you know? And Krishnamurti, he set up his schools in one of the most, be I, I read most of the things that he wrote in my twenties and thirties. And uh, he said, you know, the purpose of my schools is to end, to uproot sorrow. And so like, you know, once you get the urgency and the beauty of that statement, and you know, one of the hardest two words in English, I'm not sure how they sound in, 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 in your language, but I, I find two of the most complex words and most misunderstood words are the words urgency and emergency. And urgency, but I'm going to dwell on emergency because we have this sense of a, a pupa and a, and a chrysalis and a butterfly, right? And the butterfly comes out of the pupa or the chrysalis and it emerges. But if we think about how we use that word in our culture, it's, it's that when I say it around the butterfly, there's a sense of beauty and possibility and majesty about it. Um, and then the butterfly, you know, it's been the, the caterpillar has been eating leaves and then the butterfly lives on the fruit of shit juice you know so it's like it's like that mcfly character in back to the future it's like this you know this character that comes out of you know it needed nuclear fuel then it's living on trash and then this incredible majestic character you know it, it thrives in the shit of the world you know but um back to what i was saying like this transformation that we go through um it's an emergent process, right? But we associate the word emergency with emergency services, things going wrong, right? And then like, oh, the, the, the doctors come in and there's this, you know, it's like an emergency, he's gonna die. And there's all this like, ah, ah, energy to it. And so there's the police and there's like, and I always think that whenever you call the emergency services or whenever the emergency services are involved in a situation, it's like the neurosis generally has taken over. The psychosis has taken over, whereas the deeper meaning of emergency and urgency is this natural revealing of this abstraction that seems to be abstract, but it's the most concrete thing. And, and it's, it's a strange process because uh, for most of us, you know, our faith is in the physical. And so to transition from it's like, so that moment when I referenced earlier, you know, I was on this whale research ship when I was 18 and off the coast of Costa Rica, 200 miles out. And there's this guy and he's like, got a PhD, he's 28. And I just couldn't see myself where he was. And it was a real, it was like, unconsciously there was this, he completely dedicated himself. And I'm not judging scientists, they do wonderful work, but he dedicated himself to this kind of narrow aspect of the electromagnetic spectrum of his consciousness of sight if you like speaking metaphorically to what was true and what was false and yet when i asked him a bunch of questions that were you know broader he just said you asked too many questions so he put these these blinders on to handle the world whereas i think um you know if you're a student of of wisdom and love you're you put certain blinders on to, to the nonsense, but then you're taking this kind of incredible walk out of the, the pained garden of your history into a much more expansive version of yourself. And it's an emergent, beautiful process. But I think for most of us, you know, 
the resistance we don't even see it as resistance to the truth is very difficult and that bird was the perfect example for me because where my it's like you know those pictures that you see the course of miracles is like one of those giant pictures where you see the young woman sitting on a chair and then you turn it and you, you see this older lady who's like a gnarled bitter lady and it's like the course of miracles is like flipping that lens in your mind and there's so many blocks to, to prevent the flipping there's like scientific materialism there's um all the arguments for the terrible things pharmaceutical industry does and you know um why do young children die you know why can't we end war you know and it's just like it's like well we can't end war because we haven't ended it in ourselves you know peace is an inside job so so like it's a strange journey to take from being a sort of intellectual scientist to being someone that sees that god has our back and i grew up in a family where the word god was a, was a four letter word it still is you know so i i hardly ever mention it and i don't particularly like the word myself but i like i think the german word is got it's got this relationship well the same with the english is god and good are kind of related so what is good that doesn't have an opposite and that's really where we where we find our 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 sense of meaning you know Wow, there's a lot, a lot going on in this conversation, anyways. So, yeah. So, opening up to the the fact that we don't know what is true, we don't know what is real, we don't know all these things, and yet it is there, right? There is something there that knows, and this this allowing that to be there, and at the same time. Um, recognizing that that it's okay not to judge each other, even if one wants to. I, I mean, I, I don't know how easy that is not to judge oneself and others. It's, it's probably very easy once you know how to do it or you do it. But as long as you're not, not there, it probably seems like impossible. I have a funny story to tell about that, which I think might be a good way for us to examine it. But a friend of mine, because <laughs> I'm writing this comedy, right, which is a difficult thing to do about enlightenment, because the world is full of tragedy. And so there's endless comedy, because, um, you know, I think it was Shakespeare, that, or no, it was Charlie Chaplin, actually, who said, you know, you see any form of tragedy in the world, up close and it's horrible, but you see it from a certain distance, man falling off a ladder, you know, that's all of Charlie Chaplin's comedy. But uh, I, I wanted to create this character comedy inspired by the Course in Miracles and my study of, you know, I spent 10 years in India studying yoga and it started like the idea for the comedy, cause I, you know, was like a lot of these spiritual schools take themselves so seriously. And there is a sort of reverence for experience we have in reverence where time and space disappear and like there's no levity there in the sense of like laughing off painful experiences there's just light it's just stunning but uh i do think this um i'll tell a little story a couple of stories that lead to where i'm going but you know um in india there's a story about how uh if you go to a market and you try and sell e eggplant or aubergines as rocks you have a bunch of rocks and say buy my aubergines no one's going to buy your aubergines but if you go to a market and you sell cut glass as diamonds some people will fall for it and then you know you go and try and sell a religion millions of people will fall for it you right even though it could be full of con artists so this question of judgment um i there was a story that Desika Chah, the yoga teacher, a famous yoga teacher I studied with in India, told, and it was about Vyasa. And Vyasa was the man who um, uh, wrote the Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata. He was one of the great, you know, sage poets of the Indian culture. And uh, this is how, and I'm going to put on my Indian accent here because it's a bit funny. And this Indian accent is so funny. This is how my yoga teacher kind of told the story. And remember that half the room was Westerners at the time, and there was like this Indian sort of reverential atmosphere, 
you know, sitting at the foot of the teacher. And then, the, but this is how the story went. Like, Vyasa one day he lived on an island and he wanted to go to the mainland. So he went to the fisherman and said, "Please, sir, can you give me a ride?" And he says, "No, no, no. I am sick. I cannot help you. But my daughter, who has the fishy smell, and, I, and then, so Vyasa says, your daughter has the fishy smell.'" And I, and it, I mean, it sounds like more like a comedy than an Indian spiritual teacher teaching. But he said, uh, yeah, then my daughter with the fishes now, she will take you to the other side of the island and uh, off the island and so forth. And then the next line, he says, and then when the baby was born, <laughs> it's like, and all the Westerners in the room were like, whoa, you missed a bit, right? But there's this kind of Indian properness, like you could fill in the pieces. And that was the beginning of trying to find the comedy in judgment and the idea that the spiritual path is, you know, this great line, you know, religion is remembering to laugh. But back to your judgment statement. So there's a, um, there's a famous American uh, law of attraction money guy called Bob Proctor. And he, you know, wears a suit and he kind of looks like, to me, he looks, he's dead now, I think, but he looks a bit like um, the character in Star Wars that's the emperor um, without um, the mask on, you know, and, but, but, uh, basically he just has this law of attraction and his whole mantra is about money and you know this reverend ike and so forth and um and i i just i just find these money gurus personally a little bit um after you've studied you know people like ramana and you've, you've really gone deeply into what helen shipman's book is saying you know it, it, I, I just find this whole law of attraction stuff it's it's all it's all about like obviously i'm building a business and i want it to succeed but um but i'm doing it for the joy of it which is a challenging thing to do in our world and i feel like often like the money guys they remind me of like you know it's all about you know jesus can give you all the money in the world and it's like yeah but you're not here to be a rich man or a poor man you're here to wake up your external circumstances are kind of secondary so I called a friend and I mentioned this because I was writing these scripts for Bodhisattva because I wanted to try and find the comedy. And of course, it's a fine line between being offensive and um, pointing out um, a tragic ego flaw, right? You know, like, like if you made a story of the story I told about the bird, you think, oh, Nathan thinks he's this great scientist. And then, you know, two years later, it's like, OK, yeah, maybe I was, maybe it was just lost in my scientific materialism and um both are true right and, and at a certain level and so i could easily be offended if it was told in the right way and if you know i didn't let go of my ego which i have no interest in um, <laughs> holding on to but uh i called a friend and i said well what do you think of this bob proctor guy right and I said, I don't want to judge. And he said, I'll judge for you. <laughs> you know. And I know there's loads of devotees of Bob Proctor and they all kind of wear suits and they get this following. It's all about networking and I'm going to be your buddy. Am I going to make money and so forth? And so, you know, there's a place for that. There's a place for that. There's a place for the people that follow Krishnamurti. There's a place for the, you know, that believe that Jesus is behind everything that's happening in their lives and study the Course in Miracles. There's a place for the born again atheist that thinks that religion's a load of nonsense. And so I think where non judgment comes in is that, like, it's all about perspective. And so, you know, Ramana said, you know, the highest teaching is silence. And I completely agree with that. There's no doubt whatsoever. But we are communicating creatures. You know, why is the iPhone and the Samsung phone, why are they su successful? Because communication is as important to us as breathing. You know, we breathe so we can communicate. Uh, I am, therefore I speak kind of thing, you know. Even the most simple animals communicate in between cells and things. So I, I, I think, you know, judgment, like mastering freedom from judgment it's like a, such a funny word judgment because, you know, we use this for, and the course talks about this. We use good judgment, you know, if I, but, you know, it was really interesting when I went through that experience at the university, like one of my favorite lines in all of literature is by Parmenides. And it's the first line of his poem, the father of Western civilization. And I'll try and quote it. 
but it's the most beautiful line I think in all of literature and it's it's sort of the course in miracles in a nutshell and it says the mares was it the mares that's the female horses that carry the man who knows on the road of on the road of divinity by the pull of his longing to the place beyond which longing can go carried on so the man was being pulled by the horses and he went to the limits of where longing can take you and the mares kept going into the dark unknown and the man who knows was carried on by his knowing and it's one of my favorite lines it's not the perfect rendition of it but it's something like that and i think you know when this this i went to this wall with the university where it's like you know and i don't mean to say this from an ego point of view but where does judgment begin and end here when i say this but i was way ahead in my understanding of metaphysics and so out of sync with this kind of activist ego argument you know and it was i was obviously going to get kicked out because you know when the master is met with a student and there's a great story about this in india uh ramanuja you know he was a very advanced student and the, the teacher recognized it and was very jealous and wanted to kill him and so you know the ego daggers come out if you if, if you if you meet someone that isn't at the same level of expanded consciousness as you and it, and they 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 take a disliking to you they'll attack you and i was very much put in that position uh in britain at this university and i had you know I, my parents were sorry to say they were quite neurotic about what was going on and i you know i had to involve lawyers and so forth i had nowhere to go so i I uh, didn't feel safe. I went to a monastery and then I went to uh, a friend's house in Canada and he put me up for two weeks and then another friend paid for a flight to Colombia. And it was a, one of the weirdest experiences of my life, but I very much could relate to that poem because if I judged all of those experiences, which a part of my mind did, right? Even me telling the story now, talking about abuse and all of that, and they were horrible things that the people did, right? They, they made me out as racist and sexist and all of these things, which is not true at all. But that was their projections. And, uh, but I remember as I was walking through this experience and it was a real fight or flight thing. And of course I've studied the course for a long time. Flight was the only option, right? I wasn't gonna fight. And so I just had to get out of the danger zone and find my journey again. But if I judge that experience, if I judge Bob Proctor, right? And my friend said, I'll judge him for you because he's a very successful businessman, a very spiritual man. And he just feels this guy was selling water by the river. And there's lots of gurus out there that, you know, dress up with spiritual language, things which are not necessarily very spiritual, but people are ready to buy it. They're gullible. So this question of judgment, whether it's, harsh things that happen to you or people that you find superficial well how does it lead you anywhere valuable and so that's a big question that i have with the comedy because you don't want to hurt anyone but comedy by default you know if it's good comedy someone is being is usually being laughed at but the question is is the person being laughed at being laughed at because you're looking down on him or because of the folly of his ego activity as a as a mirror to there before the grace before the grace of god go i and so you know it's a, it's a challenging thing judgment because you know if you want to figure out which cup to use to pour your tea into there's different sizes of cup and you have to judge so the language itself is kind of challenging but then and there's nothing wrong with that kind of judgment but then the judgment of this character that, you know, a lot of people have found meaning and value from and inspiration from that my friend and I just, you know, saw as like kind of a fairly, you know, huckster-like character that was worshipping at the, 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 what do you call it? The, the temple of mana, the temple of money. Um, yeah, it's, it, remember, I, I think the key point is 
all judgment is a reflection of how we see ourselves. So, you know, that's really what judgment's about. So I, I think you have to accommodate the need for humor. You know, people do stupid things and you can laugh it off. But as long as your condemnation is of the act and not of the person, that's the key point. Um, and, and, you know, I, 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 you know, whenever something horrible happens, whenever the 9-11 happens or there's a knife attack, the politicians always get up and they always greet the popular consciousness and they say, I condemn in the highest terms this person, right? And I always think, well, that's not the course in miracles because it's, you know, love, love doesn't condemn anything. But, you know, I think you can kind of, you know, that's, there's no morality or conscience in that kind of activity. But then forgiveness sees the light in that person. And that's very challenging for people that are, are wrapped up in their projected hatred onto BP and Exxon and Shell and, you know, transgenders versus. It's, it's just like it's so polarized and so far from removed from the wisdom of the Course in Miracles. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, I think the Course in Miracles will grow and grow and grow and it will be good for mankind. But when Helen Shukman first wrote the book, she said, you know, this is for 12 people, I think, a handful of people. Well, not so, but, uh, but it's what she was pointing at was she, she was understanding just how profound and vast and different this was, you know, it was a real breakthrough moment in, and, and as a friend of mine said, you know, like time doesn't exist, but maybe in the evolution of the evolution of stories and time and species and, and, and history and politics and science, you know, the Course in Miracles wasn't ready to come into the world until now because the, the consciousness just wasn't ready for that. You know, it's a very challenging, it's like psychotherapists in general are, are sleeping ego empathy characters. They, they, don't, they don't get the, the everything is a projection of the oneself. So judgment of that, is is quite sane you know but to to make a value judgment of that is absolutely insane wow it's not the ideal spot to, to stop the conversation but i will it's time to um, wrap up so is there any point that i haven't asked you about that you'd like to share about before we wrap up completely uh, yeah, it's just a plug, like, um, so it's been a pleasure, I'm really grateful. So like I spent, you know, I spent this time in India and I I was in, in Tibet when the idea for Bodhi Sutra, the animation came to me. And it's like the first animation of its kind, it's around these, you know, cartoon characters, a monkey, two monkeys and a dog, and they live with a Californian family. And it's the first animation of its kind because it's a comedy about enlightenment and that's never been done. And I'm not sure if it could have been done before The Course in Miracles came along because um, The Course in Miracles has really simplified a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, but I mention that because I worked on that for a long time and then I realized, well, I can't just do that for the rest of my life. And so then Sutra Nova and the sort of more elegant stream of the business came along. And for, so I just want to plug those things because I'm looking for people that have um, interest in writing books around the Course in Miracles of their experience. Because the Course in Miracles is really like, the, in, in, just to sum up the Yoga Sutras, it's what is the mind? How do you cultivate it? What's the most important thing to focus the, the mind on? Um, or what are the powers that come from the mind? That's the third chapter. And the fourth chapter, what's the most important thing to focus the mind on? And The Course in Miracles is really just about the fourth chapter. And Ramana Maharshi is just about the fourth chapter. It's about waking up from the pain mechanism and ending it for good. And that's what the focus of Sutra Nova and Bodhi Sutra is. So I just, I wanted to put it out there that I'm, you know, I'm going to start an Indiegogo campaign to create this because it's like Course in Miracles speaks to a certain section of the population, which is very much okay with the Christian language. You and I were talking about this the other day. But I, I've sort of like worked for a long time to try and create this narrative. Uh, and you look at Hay House and Sounds True and these other publishing companies and podcast houses. And I, I want to sort of create this, this business stroke charity vision that, you know, can use cartoon 
to teach the course without this coursey kind of language holy spirit says this and you know and you look at monty python you know like the life of brian and it's sort of like it's like you know the life of brian in a way is a is a sort of comedy about krishnamurti's life you know so like i want i created a guru character in 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 bodhi sutra and so i'm just encouraging people like if they're interested you know you can go to the website bodhi sutra sutranopen.com reach out to me uh, if you've got a book or so forth we have the whole graphic design publishing vision and it's supposed to be just to be like a new umbrella for like the animation is to bring laughter to pain. A Frenchman in Goa today reached out. His wife had just died and he had joined the Bodhi Sutra group on Facebook. And he said, you know, I've been through so much pain recently and it was so good to laugh. But it wasn't a, you know, it was a laughter that brought me back to myself because I've just been stuck in the sense that I'm a body and so forth. So, so this is just a, a reach out to your listeners and anyone that hears this on YouTube that like, when looking to raise money for the animation, and this is coming from an inspired place, Alan Watts said, don't do something for the money, do it because you love it. That's a very difficult thing sometimes in a very money driven world. I'm living in Ecuador, my mother's paying my food at the moment, I've been sick, I'm staying at a friend's house and I'm just pushing forward on this, but it's starting to have some trajectory and I encourage you to look at the websites. And if you think you have a book in you for Sutra Novum or you can contribute, have a look at Bodhi Sutra. And it all has to come from this inspiration of we're walking each other home, as you beautifully put it, Wanaka. And thank you so much. You've been such a, a gracious host. I really enjoyed your time. And thank you for listening to me. Yeah, thank you for joining us and for enabling us to join for this walking each other home. And anyone who would like to be a guest on the podcast, please reach out to me and we will find a way. So blessings to you all, and please review the podcast if you like it, subscribe, let people know about it, because there's a whole lot of conversations on this podcast that are worth listening to, at least in my opinion. They're really, really profound, and there's a lot to learn from these conversations, and a lot to remember because of the connection that we all have to one another. So blessings to you all until next time.